G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Real Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of Life Studies. Today, we're looking at part four of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I pray that this will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you. Gifts of the Holy Spirit is part four. Uh, now, last week, uh, we finished off gifts number 12 to 19. With two of them, we saw were gifts that come and go. There was the gifts of miracles and the gifts of healings. Source of all the gifts is the Holy Spirit. He distributes as he wills. We spoke a bit on the body doctrine, where we spoke about in its one body with many members. Every believer is a member of the body of Messiah. Every believer has been baptized by the Spirit into the body. Baptized by or with the Spirit is the same in the Greek. Absolutely no difference. All gifts are given at salvation for the purpose of service in the body. Each member has an indispensable role in the body, and it is God who has placed each of us as eyes or ears or hands or, or, or big toes. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and vice versa. One part within the body cannot easily do without another part. The whole thing needs to be functioning properly. We saw that more honor is given to those parts which, parts which lack because that's where the lack is felt the most. Remember we said if you, if you put your hand cut off, you know, you'd be very conscious of your hand being cut off, so more honor is given to the hand being cut off. Now, members in the body should have equal care for everyone in the body, irrespective of what spiritual gifts you have. And what does this do? It prevents division within the body prevents division. One member suffers, all the body suffers. If inferior gifts are despised and not used, then the whole body cannot help but feel it. If one member is honored, then all are honored. A body which functions like this is a church that is moving towards maturity. All right, so let's kick on new stuff tonight. We're going to look at the order of importance of the gifts, and we say this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 to 31. Now you are the body of Christ and severally members thereof. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, then miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diverse kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But desire earnestly the greater gifts, and moreover, a most excellent way show I unto you. Paul now turns to lesser and greater gifts. And in verse 27, he says, you are the body of Christ and severally members thereof. So this contains, this just a little verse here, contains the application of the truth of the verses 12 to 26, which we did last week, where he says, now you are the body, uh, now you are the body of Christ. That summarizes verses 12 to 13 of 1 Corinthians 12, and severally members thereof summarizes verses 14 to 26, 1 Corinthians 12. So, Now, having said this, in verse 28, he next states that while there are various kinds of gifts, which he emphasized earlier in the chapter, not all gifts are of equal importance, okay? What he says here is that there is an order of importance. Notice that he numbers them. He says first, second, third. Uh, now, these numbers, they're, they're not uh, just there for fun. They are actually orders or rank, right? A more correct translation would be firstly, secondly, thirdly. And this is followed by the word then, uh, meaning... Uh, once you get to the first three, so then everything after that is now in descending order. So here he's giving the order of importance of these spiritual, of three spiritual gifts. The most important gift is the gift of apostleship. Second most important is the gift of prophecy. Now we've already looked at these two and we see that these two are no longer available because their purposes have now been fulfilled. Third most important gift is the gift of teaching. Uh, so insofar as the gifts which are available today, this is the highest. 
but in, in the order of the 19 gifts of Paul's day, it was the third most important gift because apostleship and prophecy were above it. Paul next used the term then, meaning that what he lists next is in descending order of importance. So what's the fourth most important gift? Gift of miracles or gifts of miracles. Fifth most important gift, gifts of healings. The gifts of miracles and healings may be far more spectacular than the gift of teaching, but they are less important than the gift of teaching. And the reason for that is because what we saw back in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 16, uh, that spoke about the, those gifts of the Spirit, which were especially useful for the maturing of the saints, for the building up of the body. Uh, and that's the major purpose of the gifts is to build up the body, strengthen the body, bring the body to maturity so that, you know, you and I won't get tossed about by every wind of doctrine that comes along, you know. Every new book comes out, oh, there's a new book, we need to follow after that. Not so. So that's the purpose of these special gifts. Now, the lesser gifts do not go as far as the greater gifts in the maturing of the saints, all right? So, a believer will mature faster, for instance, by sitting under a person who has the gift of teaching than he will sitting under a person who has the gifts of healings or the gift of miracles or the gift of tongues. All right. Sixth most important gift is a gift of helps. And this is a category of gifts that includes the gift of serving, the gift of showing mercy, gift of giving, gift of discernment of spirits. Seventh most important gift is the gift of what we call governments or administrations, uh, which is the gift of ruling. Eighth and last gift in the list is the gift of tongues. What shouldn't be missed in this passage here, it clearly teaches us that the gift of tongues is the least important gift. Yet, Remember, we're talking about the Corinthian church here. This is where this passage is coming from. This was the gift that the Corinthian church were emphasizing the most. As we just saw in the first three verses, Paul is showing that the Corinthians were exercising their gifts by means of carnality. They weren't spiritual. They're carnal believers. And the Corinthian church, because of their carnality, were stressing the lesser gifts and they're ignoring the greater gifts. So they were right into tongues. And this was the reason. Uh, this, and, and they were right into tongues, and they weren't interested about uh, teaching or prophecy or any of those things. And this was the reason that they were still in a state of spiritual immaturity. Uh, and we, we see this in, in, the, in the first three chapters of the of, uh, letter to the Corinthians. First chapter, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. Paul talks about them. He says, for the gifts that they were emphasizing were not those gifts that could mature them, such as the gift of teaching. They were more interested in the gift of tongues. Now, having Paul having given us now this order of gifts and letting it be known that the gift of tongues is the least important, in verses 29 to 30, Paul now shows that not all can have the same gift. The form of the questions in Greek all require negative answers. And I've, I've put down here, this is from the New American Standard Bible, uh, this, this, these 29 to 30 verse here. Uh, and this one reflects the Greek the best. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have the gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak in tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? So every question here requires a negative answer. The clear teaching here is that no single gift is given to every believer. And 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 teaches that every believer is baptized by the Holy Spirit. And verse 30 states that all do not speak in tongues. Not all can have the same gift. And these questions here correspond to the illustrations concerning the body. Not everyone can be an eye. Okay? That's why not everybody has one particular gift. Not everybody can be an eye. Not everybody can be an ear. Not everyone can be a hand or a leg. 
By the same token, not everyone can have the same gift, be it the gift of miracles, the gift of teaching, or the gift of tongues. Not everybody can have that. Otherwise, we have a very unbalanced body. Now, their obligation is spelled out in verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 12. He starts it with the word but. But, but, but. It's, it's a contrast here. So their obligation now is to desire earnestly the greater gifts. And in the Greek text, which is what the New Testament was written in, Paul used a second person plural. He says, you all desire, you, not just you individual, you, the entire body of believers should seek. He's not telling, sorry, he's not telling them that individual believers should seek a specific gift. He's, he's already stated earlier and that that's not possible. Right, Holy Spirit is one who sovereignly uh, distributes these gifts to individuals, and that's the, at the moment uh, that you're born again. He's not speaking about seeking a gift by an individual here. Uh, when it when it's in the second person plural, it means you all. You know, he's telling the church, the entire church as a group, as a congregation, as a local church, they should be seeking earnestly the exercise of the greater gifts. What's the greater gifts we just saw? Well, apostleship, prophecy, teaching. They're, they're the greater gifts. Uh, and, in, and in the Corinthians day, apostleship and prophecy were still gifts because the New Testament hadn't been written yet, hadn't been completed. Now, he's not saying here also that they should not use the lesser gifts. But in the case of the Corinthians, the Corinthian church, they were emphasizing the lesser gifts and they're ignoring the greater gifts. The emphasis is not, is, is, sorry, is to be on the greater gifts. They are to seek after higher gifts. Why? Because those, those higher gifts, they're the ones that are going to help you to mature. They're the ones who are going to help you to grow up. And since the gift of tongues, which we just saw, has been relegated to the last place, what this passage clearly it means is that as a congregation, they should not be seeking to exercise the gift of tongues, but rather they should be seeking to exercise the greater gifts such as teaching. And Paul then states that what he's about to discuss next is most important. What follows is chapter 13, which is the love chapter. Now, let's have a quick summary of the doctrine of the, of the gifts. First of all, in chapter 12, we see some clear things being taught here. First of all, every believer has been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Messiah. Secondly, every believer has at least one spiritual gift, possibly more, every one of us. Thirdly, no one is to be excluded from the use of his gift. Uh, there's a proper way and a proper place to use the gifts. Fourth, no one has all the gifts. No one believer is going to have all the gifts because God has ordained the members of the body to be interdependent. I need you and you need me. You know, a, a, a hand is no good unless it has an elbow to, to operate it. If I had all the spiritual gifts and you had all the spiritual gifts, well, you wouldn't need me and I wouldn't need you. But I have spiritual gifts that you need and you have spiritual gifts that I need. So that's why we're therefore interdependent upon one another. And for this reason, no one is going to have all the gifts. Fifth, no one gift is given to every believer. For the body cannot be composed of just one thing. For example, uh, the gift of tongues is not available to every believer. No matter how much one may try to sanctify themselves to gain it, on the one hand, no one has all the gifts. But on the other hand, no one gift is given to every believer. Six. This is just a summary. Six thing. No one should hinder the use of gifts that he himself does not possess. So, because I don't happen to have a gift that you have, it's no excuse for me to hinder the use of your gifts. On the other hand, 
because I have a gift that you don't have. This is no reason for you to hinder me in the use of my gift. There's an order of importance of the gifts. Therefore, what can we conclude? If you're a believer and you do not speak in tongues, it automatically means that you have a superior gift. So don't worry about it. Do not go seeking after the lesser gift. Instead, discover the greater gift or gifts that you have and seek opportunities to exercise them in the local body. The local church's obligation is to emphasize the greater gifts, not the lesser ones. Now, at the end of chapter 12 in verse 31, the second part of verse 31, Paul introduces his topic for chapter 13. After he tells the Corinthian church that as a body, they need to exercise the greater gifts and not the lesser ones as they had been doing, he then states, and moreover, a most excellent way show I unto you. I'm going to show you an even better way. And this has to do with love and the gifts of the Spirit. And this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Theme of chapter 12 was the doctrine of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The theme in chapter 13 is love. For love is the means of exercising these gifts. And the Greek word Paul used for love is agape. And, and you should know what that is. Agape is the love of the will. Let's see what he says. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith that was to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing, nothing at all. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, if one speaks with tongues and has not love, the speaking in tongues is worth about as much as a clanging cymbal or just a banging noise. That's all. The expression, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, well, that's given rise to the teaching that there's a difference here between a human language and an angelic or heavenly language. So what they're saying is this this is this is a this is a, a bit of a doctrine that people take. So what so what they're saying is that when one speaks in tongues, he's speaking in a heavenly language. Guess what? False. False, false, false. Actually, in verse one, Paul doesn't say that there is a difference between human language and heavenly language. Because if you have if you go back and have a look, it says, if, 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 if. He's using here an extremely hypothetical case to drive a point home. If I speak in different types of languages, whether heavenly or earthly, and have not love, it profits me absolutely nothing. It's like saying, I would not marry her if she was the last person on earth. Obviously, she will never be the last person on earth. Or in it might be said, even if I had the memory of an elephant, no one's going to have the memory of an elephant except an elephant. It's an impossibility. So he says it's a hypothetical. Yet, 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 it is used here as an extreme hypothetical example to drive a specific point home. Actually, uh, just for your, just for your, uh, your info, the language that angels speak and the heavenly language is actually Hebrew. Angels do not speak a different language than humans do. All that Paul is saying is that if there were such a distinction, and if he could speak both tongues, it would still be worthless if it were not exercised in love. It's obvious that speaking in tongues is not a heavenly language. Why, why, why can I say that? It's not a heavenly language distinct from human language. Why? Because if we look at Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came and was poured out on the, on the apostles, they spoke with other tongues. Was that a heavenly language distinct from human language? No. Was it a language of angels distinct from the language of humans? No, not at all. Why? Because the Jewish audience who came to Jerusalem from various parts of the world 
were all able to understand what the apostles were saying as they spoke with other tongues. They were hearing them in their own languages. And if that's a heavenly language, it means that the heavenly language is the same as human language. So this verse does not teach that those who speak in tongues are speaking a heavenly language. It is, if it is the real gift, it will be an earthly language, a real spoken language. However, most of what passes for the gift of tongues today is not what is described in scripture. It is quite something different. Okay, concerning prophecy, he says uh, in verse two, he says, even if one has the gift of prophecy and is able to understand all mysteries, it's worthless without the exercise of love. As for the gift of knowledge, in spite of the, the great achievements the gift of knowledge may attain, it too is worthless without love. Useless. As for the gift of faith, one might have the faith to move mountains and still it would be worthless without the exercising of love. As for the gift of giving, in, in verse 3, one might have the gift of giving to the point of being able to give away everything, but still it would profit nothing apart from love. So, need to have this agape love within, our, within ourselves, within this body of believers. Now, what are the attributes of love? We see these in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 7. And where he says, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave itself unseemly. It seeks not its own. Is not provoked. Takes not account of evil. Rejoices not in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. With that introduction in verses 1 to 3, now, in the second little section here, Paul then lists the 15 attributes of love. First, love suffers long. What does that mean? It means it's patient. Love is patient. Secondly, love is kind. It's a, it's a, it's a type of love that exercises good manners. Thirdly, love envies not. It's characterized by generosity. Fourth, Love vaunts not itself. It doesn't boast, but it shows humility. Fifth, love is not puffed up. It's not arrogant. It's not ostentatious. Sixth, love does not behave itself unseemly. Uh, true biblical love shows respect, politeness, and courtesy. Seventh, love seeks not its own. It's characterized by unselfishness. Eighth, love is not provoked or not easily provoked. It's good natured. Ninth, it takes not account of evil. Tenth, it rejoices not in unrighteousness. It's characterized by sincerity. Eleventh, love rejoices with the truth, emphasizing the goodness of love. Twelfth, love bears all things. It's willing to suffer in the face of insults and is characterized by graciousness. Thirteenth, it believes all things. It has confidence by other believers. Fourteenth, love hopes all things. It has assurance. Fifteenth, love endures all things. It exercises patient endurance. So there are the 15 attributes of love. Now, in relationship to time, we see in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13. Paul writes, love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall be done away. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall be done away. So Paul now makes a distinction concerning the element of time. And Paul makes four points here. First of all, he says, what he's making here is, love is eternal. This kind of love will be permanent and will last forever. Uh, this is not true of the spiritual gifts. Secondly, concerning the gift of prophecy, 
it will someday be rendered inoperative uh, as shown by the use of the Greek language here. According to an earlier study in, in Ephesians uh, uh, chapter 2, verses 17 to chapter 3, verse 6, the gift of prophecy became unavailable once the New Testament was completed. So that, that, that gift is finished, the gift of prophecy. As for the gift of tongues, it's going to cease in and of itself. Uh, again, the, the, Greek, the Greek middle voice here tells us it's going to come to an end. As for the gift of knowledge, it too will be rendered inoperative because, the, again, the, the way it's written in the Greek, uh, what it means is a time is going to come when these gifts will simply no longer be necessary and they'll all be done away. The only one that will not be done away is going to be love because love will remain forever, right through into the eternal order, right, to, right through and into the eternal order. Now, Paul draws some distinctions now in, in, in maturity. Uh, what, what's he doing? He explains why these gifts will not be needed when a certain time comes. And, and we see this in, in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 9 to 12. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. When I, uh, I felt as a child, I thought as a child. Now that I've become a man, I've put away childish, childish things. For now we see the mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know fully, even as also I was fully known. Okay, what's he talking about here? Paul is drawing a distinction here in maturity to explain that there's going to come a day when all the gifts will no longer be necessary. First of all, the gifts are partial and not perfect because it says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. We don't know the whole prophecy. We can only prophesy in part. So uh, the gifts are partial. They're not perfect. They will bring to the church, they'll bring the church to a certain level of maturity, but they'll, can only, those, these gifts can only bring the church so far. A time's going to come when they have done their job and have matured the church as far as it could go, and then something else must happen. But what is that? When that something else must happen is what Paul deals with in verse 10. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Um, we, we see here the imperfect. The imperfect is that which is in part. It's not fully whole. It's, that it's in part. What's that? These are the spiritual gifts of verse 9 that he's talking about. But when the perfect comes, that which is imperfect will come to an end. So, big question is, what is the perfect to come? What is it? And this verse, this verse has become a, a, a battleground between uh, pro-charismatics and anti-charismatics, between pro-Pentecostals and anti-Pentecostals. Uh, and the, the issue is here is, what is the perfect that Paul is speaking about? Pro-charismatic, pro-Pentecostal claims that the perfect is the what we call the parousia, uh, and it's the Greek term for the return of the Lord. That's what, that's what they say. And what they do is they interpret the verse to mean that when the Lord comes, when the Lord returns, only then will these gifts be done away. No need for them anymore. Uh, this, uh, this, is, this is the, uh, this is the pro-charismatic, pro-Pentecostal. However, what do or what does the anti-charismatic anti-pentecostal claim the perfect is their answer in most cases is that the perfect refers to the new testament and so what they say is that when the new testament was complete the perfect came and the sign gifts the gift of tongues healings miracles all came to an end so we have two camps two different sides here yeah The only way we can we can find out what this is is to look at the Greek language, right? And the Greek rules of grammar. Parousia, 
which is the return of the Lord, is feminine. You know, like she and her as feminine. The anti-charismatic, anti-Pentecostal point out that this cannot be, for parousia is a feminine term. However, the Greek term for perfect is a neuter term, teleos. And by the rules and laws of Greek grammar, a neuter cannot modify a feminine. This is this is back into, into school stuff. Therefore, it cannot be the parousia that Paul is talking about. That's absolutely correct. A neuter uh, simply cannot modify a feminine. Therefore, the perfect, the t t t uh, the uh, what is it, teleos, teleos, uh, cannot possibly be the parousia as has been taught in charismatic Pentecostal circles. Okay, so that's their argument. Can't work. Then the New Testament, the New Testament is, in Greek is the Kakainai uh, Didakel. I think that's how you pronounce it. That's feminine also. So the anti-charismatic, anti-Pentecostal cannot be correct either because the Greek word for the New Testament uh, for the New Testament is, is a Canaanite didactyl, which is also feminine. So we've got a problem. So the reason that the perfect cannot mean the parousia, the return of the Lord, is the same reason it cannot mean the, uh, the, the, the uh, Canaanite didactyl or New Testament. Because by the rules of, of, of grammar, of Greek, Greek grammar, both the pro-charismatic, pro-Pentecostal, and the anti-charismatic, anti-Pentecostal are both wrong. They both misinterpret the verse. Teleos, perfect, is neuter. A neuter cannot modify a feminine. So both of them are wrong. So what then is teleos, perfect? What's it referring to? Context, context, the context. What's the context of what Paul is talking about? I know it's a grammar lesson for you, uh, you know, taking you back to school. If the term perfect and neuter cannot refer to either the parousia, the return, or the Canaanite uh, 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 didactyl, the New Testament, then what is it? As always, the context is the best answer to understanding a specific verse. Paul began his discussion of spiritual gifts with chapter 12, where he dealt with the concept of the one body with many members. Now, the word for body is soma, which is a neuter noun. It's neuter. Within the same context where Paul has been dealing with the soma, the body, he speaks of the perfect, which, like soma, is also a neuter in Greek. The perfect is the soma, and when the soma, the body, is complete, that is when these gifts will be done away. When is the body complete? The body is complete at the rapture of the church. When the full number that God has planned to bring into the church is reached, the church is complete and the church is removed from the earth at the rapture. And at that point, spiritual gifts will end. Finished. Now, this verse must not be used to teach that some or all of the spiritual gifts ended with the completion of the New Testament. Unless there are other biblical statements to that fact, it must be assumed that all these gifts can still be given. Um, earlier in this study, it was noted from other biblical statements that two of the gifts are no longer available. We saw that regarding apostleship and prophecy. As for the other 17 gifts, there is no basis for teaching that any of them have been done away. However, what we do know is that the gifts must always be tested to see if they really are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, God can still give the gifts of tongues today if he chooses. He, nothing to stop him doing it. It must be the biblical gift, however, which is the speaking of a known language. It must come on the day, like every of the other, every of the other gifts, on the day that that person believes in Jesus. It's not some... Uh, aftermarket add-on, you like. It's not some after after glow effect, all right? It's not something that somebody really prays for and gets. All the gifts come at the moment one believes. 
There is a need for balance in the area of spiritual gifts and the extreme and these extremes must be avoided. And one extreme is that everyone needs to have the gift of tongues in order to be spiritual. And the other extreme states that the gift of tongues cannot be given today. And this view is based on an overreaction to the former extreme rather than on a sound exegesis of the word, a sound interpretation of the word. Need to have a balance. If it's remembered uh, that tongues is the least important of the gifts and that a congregation should be striving to exercise the greater gifts, the extremes that have hit the church in this century can be avoided. Need to have balance. Need to confirm what the scriptures say and then live to that. Verse 11 now gives us uh, the illustration of growing up. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I felt as a child, I thought as a child. Now that I've become a man, I've put away childish things. A child that does childish things. Uh, it's possible here that, that Paul writing here, the implication uh, might be that tongues are for young people immature believers at maturity he ceases to do childish things and the implication might be that as he matures in the faith tongues become less important and might be put away uh, and he begins to learn from the greater gifts and it is the greater gifts that actually will bring him to maturity not the lesser gifts Th this could be the implication here and in verse 12 Paul says, for now we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know fully. What are we looking at here? What we're seeing here is that there's a distinction made between now, where we are now, and then in relationship to sight and knowledge. In relationship to sight, the gifts of prophecy, now we see vaguely or dimly, but when the perfect has come, we will then see clearly as face to face. As for knowing the gift of knowledge, we are now in the imperfect state. So we have a partial knowledge, but when the perfect has come, we'll then know fully. Present state, almost there. First Corinthians 13, 13. The chapter now ends with verse 13 in which Paul discusses the present state. But now abides faith, hope, love. These three, the greatest of these is love. So he speaks of three things which will abide in contrast to those that will be made inoperative or that will cease of themselves. And even after the coming of that which is perfect, even after the gifts will be done away with, three things will still abide. First of all, faith will continue to abide. Now, this is not the gift of faith. Uh, this is not the, the gift of faith and the spiritual gift of faith, but this is the salvation faith, the faith that, that when we believed in Jesus. Secondly, hope will abide. Hope for what? For that part of salvation yet to be accomplished. Thirdly, love will continue to abide. Although all three, faith, hope, love, will continue forever, Paul makes the point that the greatest of the three is love. And that ends your session for the night. There is the contact details there. If you need to contact us for any reason, 